Hey horror fans, welcome back to Room 237 as I come back to you with another 80s slasher film. And this time it is 1980s Don't Go in the House. Which is a very interesting slasher film because one, it is a slasher. It's a psychological slasher, but not in the sense that like uh, Schizoid is where it's about more about the mystery of the killer. This one is more like Maniac or Blood Rage. Where the killer is the main character. We follow him the whole time. Not, not just while he's killing. But it is very, very... It, it's Maniac. It's Maniac with a flamethrower, essentially. Which is very interesting because... This was released in March of 1980, where Maniac was December of 1980. But you look at the plot, the motive, the victims, and the ending, it's Maniac. It's, but it, and I know a lot of people call this a ripoff. It, uh, YouTube says it's 1979, but it's 80. It was uh, directed by Joseph Ellison and written by Joe Maysfield. Uh, Maysfield. And it stars Dan Grimaldi, who I think a lot of people will know as... Uh, what the hell was their names? Uh, Parisi Twins on uh, The Sopranos. And, you know, Golden Age of Slashers, 1980. Um, it was, it was seized as a video nasty. Three minutes were cut up until 2011 where it was all reinstated. But this was also pretty controversial when it came out because it didn't just depict violence or violence towards women as just, you know, overly graphic stabbings and blood. This guy uses a flamethrower. This is a, a, a pyromaniac. He, he's obsessed with fire because of uh, child abuse, which we see through flashbacks. And now he uses that obs obsession with fire to sort of clean the sins of these women. And we really only see the death of one of them. Uh, that'd be the first one, and even with its 1980s pre-CGI superimposed fire effects, it's still pretty gruesome. <laughs> uh, also, so for the depictions of its violence, but also its depictions of uh, child abuse, and I mean, yeah, this is not like that movie in American Crime with uh, Ellen Page, which, which is based on a true story. That movie's horrific, you know, in its own way. But for the way just a random, like, slasher film depicts, um, and also pretty much saying that if you abuse a child, it's going to come out fucked up like this. So he plays... Uh, uh, Dan Grimaldi plays this guy named Donnie Kohler, who, when he was a child, you could get the idea he was born out of wedlock, and his mother cleanses his sins by holding his arms over a stove burner, and now to burn the evil out of him. And so now he's sort of hunting these women that more or less resemble her. And the house he lives in might as well be uh, the Bates house. It's a big, beautiful, I'm not sure, I guess you could say Victorian, but I don't think it's Victorian. But like the furniture and the uh, decor is very Bates. Um, I'm not, I, I don't quite remember, I'm not sure if his mother dies in the beginning of the film or if she's already been dead. 
but he he burns her. He works. Uh, I, I think he's a works at the public works with the incinerator. One guy catches on fire and he doesn't do anything. His boss, you know, has had enough of him. One guy does care about him and keeps checking in on him. But the next day, <clears throat> he gets all this sheet metal or whatever. Puts it all over the inside of this one room. He has a flamethrower. And basically his... Uh, modus operandi is to get women back to his house. He straps them naked like that, douses them in gas, and burns them. And then he puts their clothes back on, puts them all in this room together, and talks to them. And he hears voices like these uh, distorted whispers about how he's evil, and that person's evil, and you're worthless. And I had... I have to say, I enjoyed this movie. I did. I, I thought it was interesting. It's not a slasher that gets talked about a lot. I think it falls by the wayside because of movies like Maniac, which is a lot better. <clears throat> you don't really get a whole lot of slasher films that are the psychological character studies, like this or Maniac or Blood Rage, where the killer's the main character and they're the they're the main focus as opposed and then the victims are these random characters that are there just to die like we don't follow a group of them like the first victim is a florist he goes there right at closing she misses her bus he offers her a ride home but oh can i bring these flowers home first hey why don't you come in and meet my mother she's sick she would love to meet you and see the flowers and she's the only victim we see, and it's kind of a prolonged scene because we see her chained up, naked, and just the build-up, because he wears like a, I don't know what you would call it, but like a flame retardant suit with the big hood with the little like welder visor, and it's that long scene of him getting the flamethrower ready, clicking it on, and then it's this panned out shot of her with you know, the only movie I could think of to compare the effects would be like the end of Hellraiser when Pinhead's been defeated and like the yellow is all over him. Sort of like that pre-CGI, but it's flames. And I, I can't think of a movie where other than like an accident or a house fire has someone been depicted burning alive like this like on purpose chained up naked gas poured all over him or her and i mean her screams do get more intense than die die down you know it was a pretty intense death scene and then the rest of them are implied like there's a woman that he meets at the grocery store uh there's one other woman like, we see the aftermath. We see, like, uh, hey, would you like to come back to my place? And then we see her all charred and smoking. I, I really like the music. There's, like, like, it has this typical 80s, early 80s kind of music. But this one has sort of, like, almost like bongos with, put through, like, an echoplex or something. And then there's this other part that has more of a sharper sound. It, it has some decent creepy jump scares too because aside from the voices, like there's a part where this guy Bobby who keeps calling to check in on him, he kind of shrugs him off. But there's this one part where he's talking on the phone and he looks up in the mirror and on the staircase behind him he, he sees the apparition of his mother which her we get the idea she's burnt but it's pretty much just like black face paint or like you know smeared blackness and like frizzy gray hair as she just kind of stands there with like the kind of music sting 
it, it looks creepy. It, it's eerie looking. And then we see that image a couple other times throughout the film. But when we see the bodies in the room, it's not just the actresses with black on their face. Like, they look like, you know, snarled, burnt, charred up bodies. Eventually, he goes to the family priest for help. He shows him his arms and that it was his mother. He, uh, Bobby, well, he asked Bobby to hang out with him. I think he's trying to stop. I think at one point he's trying to stop. So he asked Bobby if they can go catch a movie or something. He was like, well, no, wait, my wife is working the weekend shift. I got these two dynamite babes lined up. We can go out, we can go out to the disco. So he goes and gets a disco suit. They go out to the club. Bobby and his date are dancing. Donnie won't dance. And I, I like this scene because his date, I guess, is trying to, you know, he's sitting at the table. She's at the dance floor. And she's trying to pull his arms, like, come on and dance with me. And he's fighting back. Well, as he, she's holding his arms, there's a candle on the table. So it's like she's ho holding his stretched out arms over the candle. The music kind of builds up. And then he just takes the candle and <laughs> smashes it on her head. We see her running around. You know, there's blood on her face. Her hair is on fire. <laughs> then her brother's at the club. He beats him up. So he's all beaten up, and then he somehow comes across these other two girls that were supposed to be going to a club. He's like, oh, I got a party at my place. And this is the only part about the ending that didn't make sense. Was, okay, now Bobby realizes Donnie's frigged up. And he's heard Donnie mention the priest's name before on a previous phone call. So he goes to the priest's house. He's like, it's Donnie. He did this. You know, we did this to this girl at the club. We got to go to his house. And um, so they get there. They don't see him, but they find the, you know, the the furnace room, I guess, with the sheet metal lined all over it. And they find one girl sort of. <clears throat> uh, Uh, detained in like the corner of the room and then the other one is chained up but they have their clothes on so I know it's a nitpick but that's kind of inconsistent with uh, the the rest of the film and then they get the girls out but the priest goes back up Donnie's in the room with all the burnt corpses and he's like yelling at him like I, I brought you in this house with trust and love and shelter and he hears the voices like he lied to you he lied to you so he sets the priest on fire but he makes it out of the house and then the ending is a lot like maniac you know he's he's in the room he's talking to the corpses and like when we see the apparition of mother we can tell it's just an actress with black on her face to look burnt but we can still make out her face here, though, like I said earlier, where it looks like burnt, disfigured, fucked up bodies, we hear, you know, the camera points at each one of them, and we hear their voices like, we hate you, we hate you, we've always hated you. And then we see them just kind of sit up and walk towards him. So it's like Maniac, only instead of these... Uh, mannequin girls it's these charred bodies and he he goes to burn them away of course the house catches on fire and it does have a bleak ending like the final shot there's this kid watching tv loudly and we hear on the news that the the Kohler house has been has burnt down and we hear the mother yelling at him. We're like, turn the TV off and go clean your room. Checks on him. He's not listening. Go clean your room. Goes back in the kitchen. Then like the third time, she comes back in, shuts the TV off. And then we get the kid's POV of her yelling and like slapping the shit out of him. 
and then he just like sits down, mother walks away, and the camera just keeps going in on him as he's got this tear, this blank stare with a tear. Kid's name's Michael, and we hear the voices like, it's okay, Michael, it's okay, we'll get her, it's okay. Implying that when he grows up, he's gonna be a serial killer as, as well. So it's kind of bleak. It actually kind of reminded me of the ending to Black Mirror, Batman book, like the last panel of Black Mirror. So yeah, it's kind of got this bleak message of if you abuse your child, he's gonna grow up to be a serial killer. There's a few interesting camera shots, like um, we get the POV of his dead mother who's in the rocking chair. So like, he's like shaking her or he he's like yelling at her and he does something and then the camera's like going like this towards him to imply that, you know, she's in a rocking chair. I like that shot. The acting is cheesy and corny, yes, I, I will agree, but I thought that Dan Grimaldi did a fine job. He's no um, Joe Spinell, for sure. You know, this movie's definitely not Maniac, but I it could have been a lot worse. I actually enjoyed it. Uh, I thought it was interesting. I thought it went at a very good pace. Um... Am I upset that we didn't get to see the kills? No. Because I thought the first one it had enough of an impact and had enough of a punch that the way the rest were implied. Because what's scarier and more effective is how he convinces these women to accompany him. I think that's scarier than seeing them get killed. You know, so kind of like uh, for like a modern movie, uh, uh, the house that Jack built, the way he can be cunning and in this movie, I'm going to use the word charming very loosely, but thinking on his feet to get these women to trust him and be on his side, how to coax them. I think that's scarier and more effective than just seeing it. I mean, we got to see it with the first victim. I think that was enough. I like the idea of showing how he gets these women. I thought that was a nice touch. So I thought it was effective enough the way it is, and I actually really enjoyed it. We don't get a lot of slasher films where the killer is the main focus. There are ways where it can not be good at all, and it can fail miserably, and yes, this movie is almost, I can't call it a ripoff of Maniac because it came out about nine months earlier. Uh, but it essentially is the same movie. I mean, a guy, a horrible childhood with his mother, he's got some sort of mom complex. He now kills, you know, because of that, and his mother is sort of this uh, tormentor in his mind, he kills, he stalks and kills these women because of his mother. And, of, of course, their methods are very different. He keeps them where he lives, talks to them, and then at the end, they... Uh, in his head, they come after him. Only here he has like a friend that's trying to help him instead of a uh, possible love interest like in Maniac. But I actually enjoyed this. I, I, I liked it quite a bit. And I'm not saying I want to see more slashers like this because I think this is a very... It's, it's an idea that I think if done too much, it won't work. So, you know, I... If I'm going to watch a slasher film, I would rather just see, hey, there's a killer around killing this group of characters. But when it's done like this, I think it works very well. And I would rather be see fewer that work well than see a bunch that don't work well. I know that sounded like a, <laughs> a disembodied tangent, but... 
Um, and yeah, don't go in the house is kind of a dumb touch. Well, not really. It could, it's not like don't answer the phone or he knows you're alone. It's like, you know, because he's trying to get coax these women to his house. So yeah, the, actually the title isn't that bad. Uh, I do know it sort of fell into obscurity. I think maybe Maniac being the better version kind of took some of this film's popularity. You don't hear it mentioned much, but I actually really enjoyed it. Uh, I, I found it interesting. Despite the acting, which I usually forgive in slasher films, I, I forgive the cheesy acting. Because uh, I can tell the actors are trying, and that's enough. At least for slasher films. And I thought it worked as a character study. You know, it it showed that he is struggling and battling with these voices. You know, the way the girl was whole, trying to get him to dance, and there was that just that little candle with that little flame. And that was enough to trigger and bring everything back. I don't know. I, I think it's sad that it's kind of forgotten and obscure. But I actually really enjoyed uh, Don't Go In The House. I was actually surprised. Because I, I didn't know too much about it before I went into it. I just heard the title. But yeah. Uh, I actually liked it. Good slasher film. So uh, Don't Go In The House. Thank you for watching. Oh!